Hi, everybody, and welcome to this Hangout. Today we're going to be broadcasting live from the uh, World Parks Congress in Sydney, Australia. It actually marks the first of five Google Hangouts that we are going to be doing for Mission Blue and the World Parks Congress's concentration on the marine theme. In this Hangout, we have a very special treat. We're going to go hunting for seahorses. I uh, want to let you viewers at home know, just to keep in mind, that you can ask questions of any of the panels directly through the Google Hangout tool. But for now, let's just dive right in. Right now, I'd like to throw it over to Richard Beavers from the Catlin Seaview Survey, who's actually live at the Parks Congress. Hey, Richard, how's it going? Yes, very good, thank you. And uh, yes, it's very busy here at the, the Parks Congress. Um, as you can see from behind me, or it's actually this direction, um, <laughs> The Ocean Pavilion is, is where we're based, um, and today we're going to be launching a whole bunch of new content, um, which we'll be talking about later. Um, but to kick off, I just wanted to talk a bit about the Catlin Seaview Survey. We've been, for the last two years, carrying out a global survey of coral reefs um, using specially designed 360-degree cameras um, that allows us to um, not only record underwater environments in a scientific way, but also upload them into Google Street View. And one of the collections that we're going to be launching today is, is Underwater Sydney. And to celebrate the World Parks Congress coming to Sydney um, and the launch of this new content, we thought we'd do a, a, a quick um, hunt for seahorses in Sydney Harbour, because very few people realise how special Sydney Harbour is. Now, um, as with technology, um, we have had a few technical issues this morning, so we've had to send in our dive, divers early who've recorded the scenes, and we're going to try and interpret uh, the footage. But I hear from Jane that it's been a little bit murky, so uh, we're just going to have to see how we go. Well, you know, thank you for the overview, and I'm looking forward to the actual footage and having you guys talk a little bit about it. Since you're there, can you describe what is actually the World Parks Congress, for those who might not know? Well, the World's Parks Congress really is a, it's a one in a, a once in a decade event, and it's where all the really sort of um, the park managers of the world come together and the policy makers come to one location to share share ideas and really to start planning for the next ten years. So the last one was over in South Africa. This time we're in in Sydney, um, and really we're hoping to see some sort of major um, decisions made here. Well, you know, we're all over this side of the uh, world, and I know people in between are all looking towards the World Parks Congress to hopefully see some really interesting things come out of that. And I, I know that this year there's a huge concentration on ocean issues and the marine theme. So, again, that's part of why we put together these hangouts. I, if I could, I'd like to throw it over to Mark. Uh, Mark, you are the collection manager for ichthyology with the Australian Museum. Uh, can you let us know a little bit about what your background is? What is ichthyology for people who might not know? Okay. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Well, not morning for everybody. Um, as you said, I'm the collection manager at the Australian Museum. I've worked here for a long, long time. I work with a team of people, and our jobs, as it obviously states, is to look after a massive collection of fishes. We have about 1.8 million dead fish in our collection, and uh, quite a few of those are from Sydney Harbour and we've documented the distributions and all kinds of information about the fishes from the region, including new species of fish. In fact, just last year, uh, a bunch of us from here at the Australian Museum, we published a paper on uh, the fishes, the mollusks, the echinoderms, uh, and the crustaceans of Sydney Harbour. And we found out that there are over 3,000 species of alone. I mean, Sydney Harbour really is a marine jewel. Uh, when you contemplate the fact that the harbour is surrounded by, uh, well, millions of people, it's a world city, and yet, as James Woodix will show you, uh, we can have some pretty good diving and see all kinds of new and amazing animals. Um, just this year, there have been a couple of, well, this year there's been one new species of fish published that's found in the harbour, and about a decade ago, there's, I can actually show you, if you like, there was a... Um, a new species published from, in fact, where this dive that you're going to see today, from the same place there was a new species described. I can show you one here. 
Ooh. <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> this little fish here, I've tried not to grip on the keyboard. It's the Sydney scorpion fish, and Ooh. there are only there are only two specimens of this species known, and it's from Sydney Harbour. Why is and, it called, uh, Why is it called the scorpion fish? Ah, because it's from the family, the family scorpionidae, and without wanting to get too technical, the scorpion fishes they all have poisonous spines on their backs, and they have they're basically spiny looking fish, you know, your typical lion fish and that sort of thing, they're all scorpions. Anyway, there's lots and lots of new and amazing things in the harbour. We've got currently got a count of 587 species of fishes that have been known from Sydney Harbour. And when you can, that's more than all of northeastern, uh, sorry, northwestern Europe, more than the UK, and that's just in Sydney Harbour, more than the um, Mediterranean, just in Sydney Harbour. And that's not even including the coastal waters. So we really are blessed with an amazing fish fauna. The trouble is, there's still a huge amount of work that needs to be done on it. I can well, see I can you are that. I was going to say that I can imagine that uh, having all that type of flora and fauna available out there makes it a very unique place for divers. Can you comment a bit on that? It, it is indeed. Um, <clears throat> the footage that you're going to see today, from what I understand, the visibility wasn't fantastic today. But it's one of the few places where you can actually um, come to a big city, strap on a scuba tank and jump in the water and see some really neat stuff. Um, sure, we don't have the, the visibility of, uh, you know, sort of Bora Bora, French Polynesia, to Vietnam last year. We divided the harbour into three zones. And the outer zone, the eastern zone, obviously gets flushed regularly by marine waters. And that's where most species occur, and that's where the clearest water is. And then near the Harbour Bridge, most people know the Harbour Bridge, of course. Near the Harbour Bridge is that central zone. And then further west is um, where you get a lot more influence of the, marine, uh, the brackish waters. And they each have different corners, different sorts of animals that live in these zones. Well, it sounds like an interesting place, and I'm very sorry that I'm not out there to A, experience the craziness that uh, Richard is seeing, and B, to actually dive down there and check it out for myself. Uh, for now, I'd like to throw it over to Emma. Dr. Emma Johnson, you're the director of the Sydney Harbour Research Program. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what the Sydney Institute of Marine Sciences does? That's right. So with a place like Sydney Harbour, as Mark described, you've got incredible biological diversity, but you also have a lot of threats to the harbour. So there's four million people, there's a lot of wastewater entering the harbour, there's a historical legacy of contamination. And so the Sydney Institute of Marine Science is an organisation that has all the four major universities plus the museums and the Department of Primary Industry and the Office of Environment and Heritage all joining together to try and understand the harbour better. The first thing we did was actually pull together all the information that's available on Sydney Harbour and put it together in this document which is available online for free, absolutely free. And it's incredible how much has been studied. So you just heard a little bit about the fish from Mark. There are loads of studies about the ecology of Sydney Harbour, the geography of Sydney Harbour, but there are also some gaps and some major gaps. And that's what we're trying to address with the Sydney Institute of Marine Science Harbour Research Program at the moment. Mm. So you've actually collaborated. Uh, it's known as SIMS, right? That's the acronym SIMS Sydney Institute. So I. I I, I've heard that SIMS has actually collaborated with the Catlin Seaview Survey. Can you tell us a little bit about that work that you've done together? That's right. So one of the major knowledge gaps we discovered was detailed information about where species are distributed and particularly our benthic rocky reef. We know where the rock is and so that's been mapped. But as to the distribution of animals and plants within that reef, we didn't have that kind of information. And so together with the Catlin Seaview Survey, we've done the first detailed surveys. Now this is incredible because instead of being down there freezing cold and getting, you know, kind of through 50 metres of transect, we're getting more than a kilometre of transect surveyed using the Catlin Seaview Survey setup. And we've trained robots, uh, software robots, to analyse the photographs. So there are 8,000 photographs from the harbour so far. The robots have analysed that and we've got now the first detailed maps of distribution of the major flora and fauna in our rocky reefs. 
I know that I know this is a little off topic, but I know that there's other scientific programs that actually take uh, photos like that, either of space or of uh, uh, to identify different species, and kind of opens them up to the public for like a citizen science type project. Is there any talk about doing something like that? Yeah, we could make the citizens of Sydney do the counting as well. So at the moment we're using software robots. Uh, it's a lot quicker. So we can essentially program the robots, train them, and then they can actually census all of these photographs overnight. But citizen science projects also have this fantastic element of outreach. So it's not without um, within. It is definitely within the scope of this project to actually engage people as well. I'd really like to pit the robots against the people and see who won. That, that, that man versus machine type thing. Um, <laughs> You want to uh, th that the audience should know about Sydney Harbour uh, before I throw it over to Jane. Yeah. So amongst the in incredible biotic diversity, one of the reasons for that is we're a drowned river valley, which um, has an incredible diversity of environmental conditions. We go from zero to 45 metres deep in the harbour. In fact, it's the only harbour in Australia that doesn't need ongoing dredging, which is part of the reason why it's so clean some of the time. Um, but also we have this diversity of you know, turbidity and light conditions and pretty much every marine habitat that occurs in the ocean bar the deep sea, actually happens in Sydney Harbour. So it's a very special environment. Now this week we've been joined by people from 15 harbours around the world, Jakarta, Singapore, Shanghai, Abu Dhabi, Rio de Janeiro, for the World Harbour Project. And what we're aiming to do is share the understanding and the knowledge of these systems, the best practice for managing those systems, and try and make sure that ports and harbours around the world are managed not only for the way that people use them, but for the ecological integrity of these systems. Is there any place that people can see the outcome of, of, of that work after? Yes, uh, the Sydney Institute of Marine Science has a website. We have a special section which is about the Sydney Harbour Research Program. There's a lot of information there, including links to our scientific reports. And the World Harbour Program updates on that program will be coming live to you. In fact, we're launching on Monday with Minister Stokes at the IUCN conference. Fantastic. Well, we'll watch out for that. Uh, Jane, I'd love to throw it over to you. Jane Jenkins, you are a local Chowder Bay resident. Is that accurate? Not quite. I actually come from Man well, the Northern Beaches, which is close by, but um, Chowder Bay is probably one of my local dive sites. I've been diving here over the last 30 years, so I'd say a local Chowder Bay diver. <laughs> But you're not just a diver, you're also an underwater photographer, isn't that right? That's right, excuse me, I'm competing with flies and cockatoos here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're out in nature, I guess. Uh, so, I've been, um, while you're trying to fight off the various flora and fauna of where you're staying, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? What should people know? Okay, um, I've been an underwater photographer. Hello? Jane? Oh, we've lost Jane. Ah, so Hello. We're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties right now with the feed from her live on uh, site, but for those of you who kind of want to know, we are going to be showing a bit of a video, as we mentioned earlier, of, earlier of the seahorses that we are going to try and hunt out. And Jane, if I do believe uh, so, is actually the one who videotaped that actual uh, video. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually dive right into that video so that when she comes back on, we can actually have her comment on it uh, if she can make it back. Everyone? Well, I, can, I can give you a little bit of background on Jane. Please do. Uh, because, yes, so she's been uh, working with the Cattle Sea View Survey really since the start. And uh, Jane's an amazing underwater photographer who's, um, yeah, multi-award winning. She's got, taken some of the best shots I think that have ever been taken in Sydney Harbour uh, of some of the creatures, um, especially the seahorses um, and creatures like anglerfish, which are, are probably my personal favourite um, in Sydney Harbour. Um, and so it was, it was great that she could join us uh, today just to go on the, the dive because she'll be able to tell us a lot more about the imagery that we see um, after the dive especially. Well, let's hope that she can, you know, 
get back on. I've uh, got to say, can I butt in here? I was in the water at Chowder Bay yesterday afternoon and it is very productive at the moment. So some people like to call it murky. I like to call it productive. <laughs> so, it's, it's a good point. When you're talking about murk, uh, a lot of time you're talking about like the various uh, phytoplankton and the various other nutrients that are just going around, and that means ooh, all the little fish and animals in there are eating and being very, very, you know, stuffed. Yeah, and there's a jellyfish bloom going at the moment as well. So there are lots of moon jellies, um, Aurelia aurita, and they're about medium size. So you know they can get quite large, but there's a bloom of them about medium size that are swimming around, obviously feeding on this really productive system at the moment. Oh, well, you know, again, as I mentioned before, I would love to actually be there. Can I jump in for a moment? I've actually got an anglerfish I can show you. Let me just hold this up. To the <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. So that yeah, is an angler fish, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. It's swimming. I want one. <laughs> there you go. That's a striped That's angler fish, and they're very common in Sydney Harbour. You can There's see it's got a, a fishing rod on its, on its nose. So I always was under the impression that uh, angler fish were really deep water fish. Um, oh, didn't realize yeah. that they came up as high to be around uh, the Sydney Harbour. Can you speak a little bit about that, Mark? You've fallen into a common trap. <laughs> now, there are two different. <laughs> there are a couple of different types of anglerfishes. Uh, there are the deep water anglerfishes and the shallow water anglerfishes. And what we've got here, obviously, is a shallow water anglerfish. The deep water anglerfish. There's a whole bunch of. These are the kinds of things like you saw in Finding Nemo when Nemo went down, or Nemo's dad, whoever went down really deep, and there was that, you know, fish with the lights and the teeth. That's a deep sea anglerfish. What we've Got in Sydney Harbour, one of the Antinaria, a shallow anglerfish. And I heard they can eat eat fish larger than themselves, or is that nonsense? Oh, uh, they probably can. Some of the some of the deep water anglerfishes have no ribs, which means that their stomachs can expand massively. We've actually got uh, lots of specimens in the collection here at the museum, and you can actually feel a large fish inside the stomach. Of, of the anglerfish. We've got x-rays that show fish curled up inside the stomach of an anglerfish. A lot of these fish oh. have teeth that backwards. They're like road spikes. So when something goes in, the, the spikes pop up, the teeth pop up, and nothing comes out. Wow. <laughs> that sounds like a handy feature coming into the Christmas season, just removing <laughs> your ribs for a while. Yeah. But I, I was swimming in, in next to Chowder Bay, and I actually saw what I think was a fan-bellied leather jacket yesterday. Mark, would that be right? It had the classic shape of a leather jacket, but underneath this very long, floppy fin, almost like a, a batfish. Yeah, Emma, that's, that's correct. It probably was a fan-bellied leather jacket. In fact, that flappy-looking thing underneath the fin is called a dewlap. A dewlap. dewlap. And, yeah, a dewlap. And the... Um, Van Bedley leather jackets have really, really large dewlaps, really very distinctive looking fish and very common in Sydney Harbour. Wow. It was stunning. Well, speaking of Sydney Harbour, how about we go right to the seahorse uh, sorry, Absolutely. seahorse hunt. Um, I'm going to just try to, and bear with me with this, because again, technology and what have you. But here is the video. So I believe this is Chowder Bay. So you can see the pylon. Yes. It is. I recognize it. Oh, there's Jane. Um, <laughs> I can spot a Jane. <laughs> so here's Jane going through, uh, starting us off on our hunt. And as you can tell, okay. it is a little bit, um, you know, for lack of a better term, murky or, you know, what was the term you were using, uh, Emma? Active? Productive. Productive. Oh, look, there's yes. some barnacles. So we have sponges and barnacles that attach themselves to the pylons uh, around the harbor. Can you tell us a little bit while we're going through this what type of you know life would generally be in, in that type of area? Yeah, so 50% of Sydney Harbour's foreshore has been modified in some way and a lot of those structures that have been built are, are seawalls, jetties, pilings, pontoons and they are essentially hard substrate, homes for lots of animals. What you're seeing there right now is Eclonia radiata which is our dominant macroalgae and it's, it's on the natural reef but it also grows on these artificial structures. But in addition to that you get a lot of invertebrates sea squirts, which some people call ascidians, um, you know, barnacles, lots of filter feeders, 
Sydney rock oysters, uh, which are a really familiar species to many Sydney ciders. They all grow in, in the intertidal zone of these pier pilings. So they're incredible structures that were put there by humans but are being colonised by a, a range of animals wow. and plants. I can't see the detail at the moment, but there's certainly a lot of colour in the background and they would be mostly the sponges that are settling and growing yep. there. So they're filter feeding animals. And it looks like um, Jane's swimming past, so she's got a, a net on the, the right-hand side. Um, and this is one of the, the nets that we have in, in Sydney Harbour um, to protect the swimmers um, uh. off the beaches. Uh, because this time of year, I think it's about this time of year, the bull sharks arrive. Um, so, yeah, so uh, department, uh, the Department of Private Industry have been tracking the bull sharks. They've been tagging them and tracking them, and we get lots of visiting bull sharks every year. And... It, the good news is they don't have a particular hot spot. Uh, the bad news is you never know where they're going to be. But there hasn't <laughs> been a, a, a fatal attack since 1969. Oh. To you, it looks like we just found something interesting. Ah. Oh, go. What is this? Moray. Moray ale. Mm. So there's oh, a lot of morays over there. It's a green moray. Green moray eel. Gymnothorax prosinus. Yeah, and they have very sharp teeth. <laughs> they do. Teeth not only in the distance, then. Roof of the mouth. So if you imagine yourself a more eel, you've actually got teeth in the roof of your mouth, which is pretty weird. They grow to about they grow to about a meter and a half long, and uh, their eyesight isn't particularly good. But if you can actually see there, they've got quite big nostrils, and unlike humans that have a pair of nostrils, just one pair of nostrils. These things have two pairs, and the water goes in the front pair and out the back pair, which are above the eyes. And they have very, very good sense of smell, not such good eyesight, and that's why occasionally uh, divers' fingers get uh, chomped if they're actually being silly and trying to feed the moray. But uh, this moray isn't considered dangerous. As I say, it only grows to about a metre and a half, but very, very common. You know, that's I'm almost as long as me. <laughs> <laughs> And why are they called green morays? Because they're always yellow. Yeah, they're very green. <laughs> you haven't looked you know, inside the rear part of the body is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the rear part of the body is quite often green. The uh, the head the head is usually brown or yellow, sometimes a bit greenish, but the rear part of the body is often green. As well, right. that's why they call the green moray. But yeah, maybe they'd be better for something. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. There always seems to be a, a moray in that that hole uh, under the under the piers there at Chowder. Yeah, most, yeah. most of the time during the day you'll see them uh, like that with their heads out of a hole somewhere. Um, they'll come out a bit at night, but a lot of the time they'll they'll lunge out of their hole to you know eat fish or whatever they're preying on. But uh, most of the time you see them like that. The other thing that's cool about moray eels is they can swim backwards nearly as fast as they can swim forwards. So that really helps when they're sort of zapping backwards and forwards in and out of their hole. Excellent. We're back. Can we, can we make the image bigger, Andrew? Yeah, let's see what we can do about that. How's that? Let's see if there's anything we can see. It's looking very green. All right. We're back. We're back. Okay, hello, Jane. Hello. It, it looks like it was very murky. <laughs> It was very murky, actually, um, unfortunately, but there's still a lot to see. You know, through the murk, you can always find something. Cuttlefish, um, excuse the helicopters now. We've got so much competition going on down here. Um, there were seahorses. So those, are, those are really red, very red sponges. Yeah, they're, they're stunning sponges. sponges. Yeah, can you yeah. talk a little bit about these sponges? Well, the cool thing about sponges is they're filter feeders. But did, um, Jane, did you want to know this? Did you know the species in particular here? No, I just know that my red anglerfish lives in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of associations being between fish and sponges and, and other invertebrates. Some invertebrates live entire their entire lives on the inside of these sponges. But one thing we do know is that sponges are very ancient animals. They're very simple. They very pretty much don't have differentiation between the tissues. Oh, here we go. What is that? You missed it. You missed it. It was, was, it was it a leather jacket. Oh, it's just kind of hiding. 
I think it might have been one of the... Oh, here it comes. Gone. Here he Be comes. Come on. He's, he's shy. Aw. <laughs> <He's, laughs> uh, we've, we've missed him. <laughs> it was a leather jacket. It was some description. And here's another. Yes, that's a, that's a fan belly. That's what Jane and I were talking about earlier. Fan yes, belly. That's right. Excellent. It used to be called a Chinaman leather jacket, but I think uh, due to political correctness, it was ch the name was changed, which is fair enough. Now we found something that's not quite good in the area. <laughs> that's my stool for when I sit down on the job. <laughs> so you found that under the pier? That was under the pier, yes. Um, I think it, you know, there's so much trash left there from the fishermen. I found fishing rods, stools. Um, Little canvas oh, chairs, the, you name is it. Is that the tail of a seahorse? On oh. a sponge. It is. Oh, no, that looks like a seahorse. <laughs> it's a whole seahorse if you look carefully. Yes. <laughs> <in the middle>. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it right here. We couldn't find any pot bellies this dive. We found lots of white seahorses, but no pot bellies. And there don't seem to be as many there at the moment as what there have been. I don't know. If, Emma, you may be able to fill me in on that. Is a different seasonality for pot bellies or something? Well, actually, I heard a rumour yesterday that there's an experiment going on that, I, that eight of them had been collected last week from the net. Um, so people are studying the effects of climate change on the seahorses and the ocean acidification yeah, issue. So yeah. I'm just going to have to turn this phone off one second. Hi, okay. Sorry I can't take your call. <laughs> <laughs> So, what have there has there actually been any? Uh, you know, you were mentioning this study about acidification and its effects on seahorse. I know that acidification definitely affects uh, crustaceans and mollusks and and other uh, other animals that create some sort of shell. Uh, and I know that there's been a, a studies into the effects of sharks and smell and uh, fish. What what effects have there been shown on on seahorses? Well, I think this is the first study, actually. Um, so I guess what they're looking for are very subtle effects on behaviour as mm -hmm. well, but also um, just on the capacity of the organism to deal with that slightly more stressful environment, so you get changes to metabolism taking place. But, uh, yeah, I literally only heard yesterday, and I was thinking, well, that's going to make uh, the hunt for the seahorse difficult if someone's already collected eight or so seahorses from the net. Well, so far we already saw one. That's, that's you, you did well, Jane. Jane's the best person at spotting them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we there, saw more than one, but you can one see. Yeah, we've oh, been oh, down wow. there. And, oh, there's another that, one. Is that one right here? There's another one. Yeah. Yep. There's another yes. one. Wow. Yes, we've you can see up, it. It's we've seen up to 200 in one dive. Whoa. Fantastic. I've done seahorse counts down there with David Rasti, and, you know, we've counted up to 200 in a dive. So... They're just hiding. They were shy. They were camera shy. <laughs> so, can you tell? Can you, uh, Mark? Can you tell me a little bit about the coloration of this one? This one seems very purple. Well, the coloration is quite variable. Uh, in the white, it's called white seahorse, but it's named after Mr. White. It's nothing to do with the color of the fish itself. The coloration is quite variable, and I think it varies also depending upon the habitat. One of the really interesting things about this, most people know, it's the male seahorse that uh, gets pregnant, so to speak, carries the young. And um, he has a gestation period of about three weeks and then can uh, uh, spit out, so to speak, a couple of hundred young seahorses that come out of his pouch on his belly. While they're in the pouch, he nurtures them, looks after them, aerates the eggs and uh, does all the, all the, the good housework and, uh, before giving birth to them after about three weeks of, uh, of pouch time. So, yeah, they're quite remarkable animals. And then the, the male and female will pair up again and... Oh, well, almost straight away, he'll get pregnant again. So, yeah, the coloration varies. The feeding of these things is pretty interesting too, actually, though, as you know, a seahorse has kind of got its head sort of cocked down at an angle of its body. If you can see my hand there, like this, my finger. And when it feeds, it lifts its mouth really quickly, like that, which forces water into the mouth and sucks in the little crustaceans on which they feed. So, yeah, they're pretty cool. You can sometimes see them feeding. It's a quick lift of the head which sucks the water in huh. along with the prey. Look at What's that. Incredi 
What's incredible also is, is the way that they're camouflaged in amongst that really diverse community. You, what you're looking at now behind the seahorse are maybe seven you know, species from seven different phyla. Now phyla is a really high level grouping of animals. Uh, when we classify species, we classify them into phyla and it's almost, it, it's the level of kingdom. So you're looking at the seahorse, which is obviously a vertebrate like us. But then there are sponges, there are crustaceans, there are polychaetes, there are hydroids, just these massive groupings. And it's typical of a marine environment. Even in a harbour like Sydney, you have this incredible phyletic diversity of species because life evolved in the ocean. It's so exciting to watch. Yeah, that's a good point, Emma. When <clears throat> I mentioned earlier the paper we wrote and the 3,000 species, we didn't even touch them like sponges or hydroids. There's whole groups that we didn't touch. So the harbour is, well, what we're looking at here, you can see the richness of the, the uh, yeah. animal and uh, plant life here. It's really quite extraordinary. So there's so much more to discover. I mean, certainly where in my area, the fishes, um, we've only really just scratched the surface. The larval or baby stage an idea what they look like. Even commercial fish, there's something called a pearl perch. We don't know where its babies live, what they eat, anything about them, and yet we're harvesting the, the adults as a commercial industry. So there's so much more we need to do in Sydney Harbour and in um, biology in general. Oh, it looks like we got another one right here. And there's another one. <laughs> oh, you did well, Jane. <laughs> what I I I did we just what interrupt a whole bunch of seahorses sleeping? Is that is that what we did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing about these seahorses is you can see that they've got a, a, a tail that can wrap around things. That's called a, a prehensile tail. So they're covered. Their whole they, they're a fish. They've got a backbone and they've got gills, but uh, the body is encased in rings of bony armour, and mm. the tail prehensile, they use it for hanging onto sponges and various other things down the bottom. Of course they're, I mean whilst they can swim, they're not the they're not the fastest swimmers in the world, they're not like tuna, you can see they've only got little little fins, so uh, they use that to hold on to uh, substrate on the bottom. So can you tell, you, you mentioned that they can swim, can you talk a little bit about the mechanism of how they swim? Oh wait, what are, what's this? These oh, little fish. Hula fish. A common fish in the city. Yeah, like doing a dance, the hula fish. Except they're not wearing little grass skirts. Uh, yeah. I've, actually, I've actually got a hula, hula fish here for you if you want to see what they. Can you see that? Okay. It's hard to see. No, it's it. So we're, we're looking at some spiny sea urchins here. This is really interesting because. A lot of the rocky reef, uh, I guess the dynamics of rocky reef systems is this interaction between the macro algae that form the, the canopy, which is almost like the forest, and these urchins which, which mow it down and eat it down. But urchins are actually really indiscriminate. They will eat plastic if given an opportunity. So here they are, they're sitting on the pylon and they're eating all of the, the mussels and the sponges and the sea squirts that are living on that pylon. They just, they'd be just as happy with seaweed. Well, I just want to remind all of our viewers back at home that you can ask questions of the panelists at any time. Just use the question and answer period, uh, sorry, the question and answer tool uh, in the Hangout. And I know that there's quite a lot of interesting stuff that we've already seen, um, including this very active region. Wow, look at that. Yeah, the finger sponges are stunning. Yeah, it always amazes me all the colors that you get under the under the piers at Chowder Bay. It's quite a few yeah, legs down. Another jacket. Another fan building. It's one thing um, we've had in summer seasons when it's been warm water. Um, it's like a Nemo movie, actually. We've had ornate ghost pipefish and robust ghost pipefish down at Chowder Bay, which I've only ever seen in the tropics before. So I think the EAC might do a swirl into Chowder Bay at certain months of the year and bring all the tropicals that... Um, We've been seeing there last summer and the summer before. Wow! Look at that yellow. Yeah, you can see. You can clearly see the dewlap there. That big flap underneath the uh, the body, and the the um, these fan-bellied leather jackets are known for that. Uh, we were just talking about a second ago with the EAC. That's the East Australian Current, and anyone that saw Finding Nemo knows all about that. It's a 
warm current, warm tropical current that flows its way down the east coast. It swirls and eddies and circles its way down the east coast and it brings with it all kinds of uh, tropical species. Um, tropicals are regularly found in Sydney Harbour. Most of them die out over the winter because it gets too cold for them. Um, but some overwinter and, you know, you'll, you'll end up with a uh, range of species that can get tropical harbour. Yeah, so... Uh, and so this is an increasingly important issue for the harbour because every year we are seeing slightly warmer water and we're seeing more of these tropical fish over winter. They haven't yet been observed to, to become reproductive or establish reproducing populations, but it, it seriously is only a matter of time. So researchers are trying to understand and predict what's going to happen when we get this suite of new species that are actually able to become adult fish. Many of them are herbivores. Uh, and we haven't had uh, very uh, active large populations of herbivorous fish that might, so we're expecting really big changes associated with climate change happening not just in the coral reefs where you might see substantial amounts of bleaching for example but also in these temperate waters where the distribution of species changes and that it kind of flips the whole dynamics of that system. Yeah absolutely, one thing I should throw in there is the uh, state emblem State fish emblem for New South Wales is the blue groper. It's misnamed really, it's a wrasse, but either way, it's called the blue groper. And it's now found in northern Tasmania and people and regularly being sighted in northern Tasmania. Um, it was there in the past, but for, it was locally declared extinct. But now, with the warm water regularly coming down to Tasmania, it's become, they think, a resident down there in northeastern Tasmania. So, as Emma said, yeah, we're seeing some changes in fish distributions, perhaps as a result of climate change. So, we actually ran out of video uh, for these seahorse hunts. We came to the end of that, but we have seen quite a few interesting species, both flora and fauna. And you know, I was just wondering if uh, each of you could just comment a little bit about what was some of the interesting things that you saw in the video that you that kind of st uh, stood out at you. And since, uh, Jane, you took the video, I'd love to, or you were the present, so I would love to get your perspective on it. Um, well, you know, although the conditions weren't good, I find Chide Bay, when you come here, there's always something to see. Um, we managed to find the amount of seahorses we did. There was cuttlefish in there. There was um, a few octopus. Um, there's always something at Chowder Bay to see. So, you know, I... I don't even know how many dives I've done here, but never is one dive the same as the next. So I hope it. I hope we continue to um, be able to see Chowder Bay as it is. Well, any any type of footage that you send to me, I will definitely watch. That was very intriguing. Well, come um, over and dive it for yourself. I'll take you diving. <laughs> all right, I, I'm going to take you up on that. Okay. <laughs> Emma, can you uh, speak a little bit about what you saw? Yeah, one of the fascinating things I find about ports and harbours around is that not only have you got lots of built environment, uh, which is obviously being taken advantage of by all those species that we saw today, but um, you also have introduced species. And so you might not have noticed, but as we went past, uh, every now and then you'd catch an eye and there would be a species that actually never evolved here. It's been transported here by ships. Particularly, I saw quite a few bryozoans that looked very suspicious. And that's another one of the challenges that we have in our port environments is how to manage this uh, massive amount of global trade that's bringing species on the bottom of ship hulls but also in ballast water into these systems. They tend to take advantage of the artificial structures and so I think we've got an opportunity in Sydney to, to better manage the system by building our artificial structures in ways that mimic natural reefs and give the natural fauna the fauna that have evolved here, a better chance of surviving, rather than creating structures that are really unusual and unnatural. Yeah. I know that uh, lionfish have been a big issue up and down the coast uh, over in, in the United States, uh, and it's been a huge problem as an invasive species, and, you know, an invasive species can completely wipe out an ecosystem if it's not managed correctly. Um, yeah, and that was introduced through the aquarium trade, I understand, and because it's such a voracious predator, it can have a really big knock-on effect to the rest of the community. Well, hopefully uh, that gets solved fairly quickly. Uh, Richard, I want to throw it over to you. Uh, in regards to the video that you watched, what kind of struck you as somebody who takes, you know, 360 video? Yes, I mean, for me, it's it's... It's always a joy going for a dive in Sydney. I mean, you're looking at a dive site that is, is about 50 yards behind uh, Jane at the moment. 
um, and it's in the centre of a, a major city. And how can you have seahorses in that environment and people aren't aware of it? And that's really what this project is, is about to a large degree. Although it um, really is an intra, uh, international project, um, you know, with partners like Google, we've got Catlin Insurance, we've got uh, the University of Queensland as our sort of main partners, including the IUCN that are running this conference. It's about working with local partners to reveal local environments that's going to be critical moving forward. And being able to work with the Sydney Institute of Marine Science and the team to be able to reveal what's on our doorstep, I think is a great model for taking um, all around the world, being able to just allow people to connect with their own local marine life. And, and we're hoping to do a lot more of that today with the launch of some of our underwater Sydney content and a lot of the species that we've been mentioned will be featuring in that content. So uh, look out uh, on Street View this afternoon and you'll be able to see underwater Sydney for yourself. That's fantastic and for those of you at home who haven't just played around with the underwater Street View yet, there's already loads of areas to check out. In fact, uh, this last week was the launch of some footage from the Aquarius Reef Base off the coast of Florida. And not only do you get to zoom around and check out all the exteriors, they even incorporate it so you can get a cool little tour of the interior of the Aquarius Reef Base. So definitely check that out. And I know that I personally am going to be, you know, zooming around this afternoon once the Sydney uh, footage is out. Um, Mark, I'd love to get your perspective on the video you saw, the footage, the species, that you know, all the different items that you talked about. Sure. I want to step back one little step and say that a lot of people come to Sydney, lots of tourists from all over the world, and it's a, it's a lovely city. The harbour is beautiful, and taking a ferry ride, a boat ride, uh, across the harbour on a sunny day has got to be one of the most beautiful things you can do. And I don't say that uh, just because I'm a Sydney resident. It really is a lovely, mm -hmm. lovely place to go. But as you, when you're on that ferry going across the harbour in the sunshine, gentle breeze, maybe sipping a beer, no. Um, <laughs> basic looking at the buildings, you're looking at all the stuff around you, you're looking at the bushland and what have you, but a lot of people forget what's actually below the boat. Uh, you see the, the blue surface and it looks like a, a blue desert, but there's so much life under that harbour, under that surface that you're cruising over when you're on that boat as a tourist. And I think you know, sort of um, the work that all of our organisations are doing is trying very hard to promote that and show what we have here is really something special and should be preserved and sh there should be the resources allocated to have people doing the research and understanding what's actually here. It's really, really important. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a new species of fish described uh, from around Sydney, including Chowder Bay, where Jane had her dive. I can show you this guy. It's called a red, red-fingered anglerfish. It's an extraordinary little fish. Can you see that? Yeah. And it's called red fingered anglerfish because it actually has it's like it's got red painted fingernails. This this <laughs> specimen preserved, so you can't see that. But if you get onto the Australian Museum's website, there are some fantastic images of it. And that a species that's found in Chowder Bay and we knew nothing about it until until it was described earlier this year. So uh, the, the harbour is such an incredibly rich place. The things that unfortunately we didn't see in the video, there's lots and lots of schooling fishes that um, occur down there, you know, things like yellowtail scad in particular, and Australian maidos, really iconic species for Sydney Harbour. And I'm sure that Jane would have seen them, except that uh, they weren't caught on video in this particular dive. So, yeah, just my final comments is, yeah, incredibly rich place and uh, really, really worth putting the research and effort and resources into preserving. Well, definitely that's a great message for, you know, this week being the, the uh, World Parks Congress and the IUCN all coming together to uh, discuss best practices for management, and different stories and what have you. Uh, we don't really have that many questions coming in, uh, but I know personally that I learned a lot more about seahorses and about the actual flora and fauna around the Sydney Harbour, and uh, more than ever I want to go out there and get underwater. Uh, we have about three minutes left, so let's have final words just in general about you know getting out there and getting underwater. Jane, let's throw it to you. I'm going back in the water in about 10 minutes when we finish. <laughs> 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 so I'm really happy. So yeah. I will look out for that red-fingered anglerfish, Mark. <laughs> Go for it. Excellent. And, and we'll post any uh, any photos you get on the uh, Catlin CV survey site. Okay. I'll be out there in about half an hour by the time I get geared up. 
<laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Alan. It's a very, it's very, very hot day in Sydney. So I encourage all of the Sydney siders and all of the, all of the visitors to the IUCN Congress to jump in the harbour and have a snorkel around. There is so much to see. The bio, biotic diversity is incredible, and uh, I guess what we need to do is just work harder to try and preserve that biotic integrity into the future. It's going to take a lot of research. It's going to take a lot of revealing the environment and uh, a lot of cooperation between government, between local communities and between researchers. But I think we've got a positive future to look forward to. Here's hoping. That's a great message. Richard, you're there at the uh, you know World Parks Congress. How much do you want to be underwater instead? <laughs> oh, so it's, it's, I would love to be down there with Jane, to be honest. It's one of my favorite places in the world, jumping in off the, the pier at Chowder Bay because it's just bizarre life. Um, and wherever you look, I think pre pretty much every dive that we've been on together, we've found something and you just look at it and you just, I've got no idea what it is. <laughs> and it's one of these magical places with just strange, strange creatures. Uh, beware of the briny deep. Mark, yourself? Uh, I'm stuck in an office today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm not sure I really want to speak. I'm not going diving. <laughs> yeah. Very sad. Mind you, I, every day I come I'll to work here, I feel like we're we're making a contribution, which is which is always worthwhile. It's a good feeling to know that you know you you feel that your work is actually making a difference. Sure, I'm not diving. I hate you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that this panel seems to all want to be underwater, and so should you. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of my panelists to speak on this awesome seahorse hunt. Again, sorry about the technical difficulties, but we got some really great footage and saw some pretty interesting, you know, tired guys attached to some different sponges. For those of you who are not at the World Parks Congress, definitely keep an eye on these events. It's one in every ten years. It's just fantastic to see the different parties come together and talk about the best practices and how to go forward, especially the focus this year on the ocean. Keep in mind, this is the first of five hangouts that we're going to be doing throughout the week to cover the ocean theme and the World Parks Congress. So from myself, from Mission Blue, from all of my panelists, thank you so much for watching and try to get in the water. Thank you.